Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 832. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 28th, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. You're here to have fun. We're here to have fun. Talk about the news going on around the world. Most of it Anglican, a lot of it Christian, and a lot of it just the chaos you see when you watch the news at night. We're here to cover that as well. Uh, George, hey, uh, I'm going to show our audience a quick picture here. Uh, They they need to know that the fun that we have. Uh, Boom, 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 boom. Who are those two guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So George and I actually had a Thanksgiving together. We d- have done that every year now for four years in a row, I think. Three or four years. Uh, mm-hmm. We go to a local restaurant here in the uh, Florida uh, area, and uh, we let do- other people do the cooking. We entertain our our family. I uh, had mom with us this time, and it was a lot of fun. Well, you can tell the Floridians from the si- snowbirds and the tourists at the restaurant. Yes. Because they're, <laughs> half the people have short pants and short sleeve shirts. And then there are people like me with the wool pants and a blazer because they're freezing cold. Uh, so, oh, uh, it was a lot of fun. And it, it was, I guess, 70 that day, and you were cold. Oh, uh, yes. yes. But we, we had a great time. Uh, and I got up this morning, George, and I'm sorry, audience, we're going to talk, talk a little bit about Florida weather. Uh, here at Sasquatch, I got up, I w- went to get my teeth cleaned. Uh, with my wife, we had an, our our annual appointments to get everything done here, and it was like forty eight out. And I go, poor George, poor George. What? Well, why are you wearing a white shirt today, George? Today's laundry day, Kevin, and I have about a month's worth of clergy shirts that I have to iron. Uh, after th- uh, however many years we've been married, long time, thirty five plus, whatever it is. 38, 39. You need to be able to recall that number. Routine. We have a routine. (laughs) And Susan will wash, but she hates to iron, so I have to iron. And I haven't felt like ironing because it's been so busy. And so Mm -hmm. I get up this morning, go to my closet to get out my nicely starched, crisp and starched pre-shirt, and they're none. And so I have to dress in mufti today and uh, look like a stockbroker or whatever. Or, uh, you do. One of, these, one of these guys on the, uh, CNBC or whatever, uh, touting yeah. stocks. Sure. But, uh, uh, yeah. I, I have a massive sinus infection here on my right side. Uh, I'm a little out of cahoots. I took a cup of Motrin. Hopefully the swelling will go down before I can talk to the doctor, get some more uh, um, what's it, antibiotics. So... Uh, please excuse me if I'm a little off today, and please forgive George's white shirt. Let's move on to the news, George. Um, pulling up the news page here. Uh, we have show notes up. I've been asked in the comments, why would a, uh, a show called Unscripted have show notes? Because George and I are in our 50s and 60s, and we don't have a memory beyond 20 minutes. So we'll make a list of stories we're going to talk about, but there's no detail to these stories. We'll talk about these five things, and that's it. And those are called show notes. And here we go. Uh, I think the biggest topic I've watched over the last uh, 10 days on the Internet and Facebook is the reaction to the Church of England's LLF decisions and votes and and feedback, George. Fascinating seeing the responses. On the left, Jane Ozan, who is one of the leaders of the gay and lesbian <clears throat> movement in the uh, general sit in the Church of England, has resigned in protest. She has resigned, and I don't know her personally, and I'm not going to engage in long-distance psychoanalysis, but I don't get her reasons for resigning. She feels offended that the Church of England is not kicking out those people from the church who disagree with her on homosexuality because she believes those who do believe homosexual relations, genital homosexual relations, are sinful are engaged in a form of abuse. They're abusing her and other gays and lesbians by not accepting them as she on the terms she sets. That's a safeguarding so, issue then. That's a safeguarding issue. And yeah. so she has resigned from General <clears throat> Synod in protest to uh, Justin Welby not taking a firmer stand against mean people like George 
um, who yeah. do not agree with her worldview. Yeah. And she's an outlier. I mean, I, she has her personal reasons, which I really don't fathom quite well. But then we have other people like Charlie Bell, who was a, uh, a fellow at a Cambridge College, Girton College, I believe, and a priest in the Diocese of London, quite uh, vocal, uh, gay, out, self-described gay clergyman, who is saying, this is step one. We've broken the ice. The log jam is broken. You know, let's think of all the analogies and throw them in. Uh, the dam is burst, and we are marching toward upper up the uplands of joy and happiness because we will soon have gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Blessings is not enough <clears throat> because we're we're blessing the people, and the Church of England is trying to be squarely and say, well, we're not blessing the relationship. We're just blessing the people involved in the relationship. And Charlie says, this is utter and errant nonsense, and we're going to keep marching till we get full acceptance of same-sex no, marriage. They don't want Blessings acceptance. Are not enough. They don't want acceptance. They want affirmation. Yes. The, the church yes, accepts do. you for who you are. We don't affirm the lifestyle is one that will uh, flourish with you or the church. So the left's response in general has been well short-term joy that they want a victory but then this is the first step we're not satisfied with what we have right now we're going to take it harder and farther and deeper an interesting reaction that has is the non-reaction of the vatican the roman catholic church every when the church of england uh, passed women clergy uh 30 years ago 25 years ago uh, when we, when the Lambeth Conference in 1930 approved contraception, whenever the Church of England and the Anglican world makes a major change in doctrine and discipline, and the three in the last hundred years have been contraception before, contraception, divorce and remarriage, women clergy, and now homosexuality, whether it's on the sin or the blessing side, the Roman Catholic Church has been a quick, almost immediate to respond. And who has been silent? The official Roman Catholic Church and well, <clears throat> Catholic commentators have responded, oh, sure. uh, both in favor and against, but mm -hmm. no official statement from Rome has been made, which is telling. The silence is telling because it either says one of two things, that Francis is so sick, so ill with this flu or whatever he has, that he basically is out of contact with the world. Or the Vatican is not wanting to be con condemn it uh, because they're heading in that direction as well. So they don't want to have uh, the, their fingerprints on the knife that stabs uh, the Church of England uh, <clears throat> when they're going in the same direction. Well, I mean, is the Pope jealous that uh, the Church of England did it first? Or is he going to use that as a template for how to get uh, uh, the Roman Catholics on board? I, I don't know. Well, yeah. the Pope has been doing some really squirrely things lately. Mm -hmm. He uh, he invited transgender prostitutes to the Vatican. Uh, um, what was I, his, I don't well, mean okay. as, as no, clients, no, but, but, you know. What was the reason, um, if it was to, to minister to them? To the outsider and okay, whatnot. Well, to uh, accept it and, and bring you into the church and let the Holy Spirit do its work? I'm for that. To affirm that this lifestyle... Uh, is not something God cares about. Ooh, ah, you can't go there, George. And then the Pope Francis did a Welby where he had a delegation from Israel and he called uh, a Jewish delegation and he called the uh, attacks by Hamas genocide. And then he had a Palestinian de delegation and he called the response of Israel genocide. And the Vatican and all this was reported out and the Vatican newspaper Vatican press office said no 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 Francis didn't use the word genocide uh, to describe Israel's war against uh, the Hamas terrorists and then uh, the 10 people who were in the Palestinian delegation said yes he did so either he's losing it or is it a Joe Biden case where there are people actually running the show and the Francis is the figurehead don't know i'm no. not deep into that world no 
And uh, yeah, why would we be? We're we're Anglicans. Uh, but and then it, there's the, the, the but what about the yeah? I was gonna say, what about the evangelicals and the Anglo Catholics? What are what are they telling us? Well, the society bishops have so far been silent. Individual society bishops voted against the proposal mm -hmm. uh, at uh, General Synod. Not all the society bishops are members of the uh, uh, Synod, but they've not issued a joint or collective statement in response. So I don't know what that tells us, but the Anglo-Catholics, their generals are not issuing orders, if you will. As I say, and with the evangelicals, we have the problem that everybody thinks they're the general. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> we have no natural leader, if you will, coordinating things. We do have individual groups and individuals making statements from the church society to the Church of England Evangelical Council to uh, 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 Rob Monroe, the flying bishop of Ebbsfleet, who is the flying evangelical bishop. We do all we do have different things, but it's looking at this stage like the uh, we published an article in Anglican Inc. from Nigel Atkinson, an op-ed piece, a story he gave to the Chester Society, an evangelical uh, group up in the north of England, and he quoted Martin Luther and in this speech, and that's where I took the title from, Asleep in the Cavern of Enchantment. And his response was, this is terrible, but God has called me to serve at this parish, at this time, with this people, and if I walk away, I'm abandoning and hurting the people, and I'm going to stay, and I'm going to fight. But I know I'm fighting a rear guard action, but I still am called to be faithful at this time and in this place. Now, that's what I would call a George Conger answer, because that's my attitude in the Episcopal Church. I've been called to fight and serve where I am today. Fortunately, I'm in a little fortress called Central Florida. <laughs> you you have where, what, we, what we call a safe bishop, a safe, safe diocese. Bishop, you, you, safe. You're in charge of the deanery, right? No, I used to be the dean. I, okay, so, I gave that up. But come on, you, you have everything a conservative uh, Episcopalian would want. Yeah, see, like to the north in Florida, Diocese of Florida, I would say about 15% of their clergy are liberal. That's the tipping point yeah. where they could destroy Charlie Holt. Central Florida, amongst the clergy, uh, 90, roughly 90 parishes, we got two that are liberal, and only one of them is a disagreeable person. So we're not at that tipping point. Far from it. But the Church of England Evangelical general response is, is my response, which, and of course, there's the public statement, which is, I have been called to serve these people. These are whom God, you know, this is my family, and I cannot walk away from them because the way the laws are structured and this and that, it's the same with the Church of England. You can't take your church out of the church, parish out of the Church of England. And then there's the unspoken private quiet stuff. I'm, I'm just over 60. What am I going to do? How am I going to support myself? I have two expensive children and an expensive trophy <laughs> wife. I can't walk hey, away. Hey, this is true, yes. <laughs> I can't. I, I huh? have financial concerns. Mm -hmm. And there. so now these are not what is paramount in my heart. I mean, I've not forced or compelled to do anything contrary to my conscious, consciousness, conscious. But of course, we need to keep that in mind, and we shouldn't condemn people for being realists. But no, it, the difficult it, thing is that there are no safe dioceses in England. Here's something where an Episcopalian actually has a better thing. If you're in Dallas, if you're in Central Florida, if you're in Southwest Florida, if you're in Springfield, there are a few places where you are safe. I don't know if that's true in the Church of England. I you know, and I you were talking about being a realist. I saw a uh, forum post three or four months ago about when is the slipping point going to be where the Episcopal Church has uh, gone down so far that the ACNA has outpaced it um, in attendance. In, in attendance, I don't, mm -hmm. and I you know the, I think the article said five ten years that's going to happen. And I don't know if that's something we want to put into our ju judgment of where we belong. 
Now, I, I, was, I was kicked out of the Episcopal Church a long time ago. I kind of knew right away uh, in, in the Diocese of Connecticut, I, I had no future, and um, I, should, I should look for helping the church grow in other ways. And that's why I'm a member of the ACNA. I know many faithful Episcopalians, like yourself, who stayed behind and have fruitful ministries. So, you know, the, but there is the that, that dichotomy. To, the other thing that we need to keep in mind, mm -hmm. um, Jeff Walton raised this point. Uh, we refer to him often on our show. He's one of our <laughs> contributors, Frank and he's a really he's great fine fellow. Yeah. Jeff raised the point that the successful growing Anglican ACNA parishes have something all in common, apart from being in the ACNA, that they're either in university towns, suburbia, or urban centers. Yeah. Uh, there is no ACNA presence here in Hooterville, and there never will be. We are in a rural... A very, you, you live in rural Florida, Kevin, yep. and you have to go to Tampa I have to go for to Tampa. an ACA church. Tamp ACNA can always plant churches in Tampa. They could plant mm -hmm. one in Ocala, another si the city nearest to me, or to Gainesville. Sure. But they're not going to plant one in Inverness and Crystal River <laughs> or Lakanto or Homosassa. Yeah. Um, and what we have in the Episcopal Church is we have we still have a great many rural or ex-urban parishes with faithful clergy and faithful people uh, whom the National Church had just passed by. Uh, you know, one of the little, I, pu I published an event thing on Anglican Inc. without any comment, and it was a uh, Holy Trinity, uh, Trinity Episcopal Church in Houston is having a drag me to the church Christmas party, have to be over 18 to go. <laughs> And it's a drag queen show to raise money for the church. And, you know, at what point do you go, oh, gosh, you know, it's over. But <laughs> for me, 15 years ago. For you, not yet. But, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but in, yeah. in, in fairness, you know, the ACNA can't plant a church in Hooterville. If there were no Episcopal, Episcopal Church in Hooterville where you work, uh, they could not plant a church there as well. You've you've been there the longest. You you have an established ministry. Um, and that's part of. We've basically your success. sucked up all the liturgical Protestants. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> Any mad ca you get the bad Roman Catholics, and you get uh, the the Protestants who have relocated from um, uh, parts of New Jersey. And, other, and the other... Baptists who finished college. And the Baptists. Um, <laughs> Jeez, George, you're killing us. <laughs> so, they, so... The, so the dynamics of uh, the ACNA, <clears throat> I have no doubt that they are going to, uh, well, I shouldn't say I have no doubt. I would not be surprised no. if the trajectories, at a certain point, the lines in the graph uh, cross. Yeah. Um, we have a story further down the list. I'm just going to throw it in right now. Ruin your list, Kevin, which is the National Cathedral in Washington. Oh, please, States. yes. <laughs> National Cathedral has uh, is got tickets on sale for Christmas Eve. You have to pay $7 to go to the Christmas Eve service, the National Cathedral, mm -hmm. which has caused a great deal of uh, jocularity and negative comment on the Internet. And then pe causing people to scour the National Cathedral's website and to find that if you want to be baptized, you have to be giving financially for six months. And people ask, is this simony? And uh, no, because yeah. you're not buying church office. You're just yeah. basically being part of a corrupt organization. But I can see if you don't really believe in God and you've got this entertainment venue yeah, you might as well charge if people are willing to pay for it. But Jeff Walton has pointed out that in 10 years, the National Cathedral's uh, attendance has fallen in half. Right. It's like three or 400 <clears throat> on, a, on a Sunday. Um, that, you know, that is dwarfed by uh, the Falls Church across the river. And uh, I think Truro Parish, um, other mega Anglican parishes in Northern Virginia do much, much better. Uh, in terms of attendance, um, and we'll continue to do so. And the Falls Church has been planning churches all across Northern Virginia. Jeff Walton had a story. Again, Jeff Walton. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, we really start need to pay this guy. Again, yeah. Jeff Walton had a recent story about the successes of the <clears throat> plants in Northern Virginia. But again, these are all suburban Absolutely. congregations yeah. with working professionals 
they don't have one out in Hooterville where George and Kevin live. Now, like the church I go to in Tampa, I go to Trinity Anglican Church in Tampa, and they have only been a church for a year and a half. They bought a church, and they're pretty close to outgrowing that church unless they start having multiple services. You have multiple services at your uh, church. I say I hate to say Hooterville in Lucanto. Uh, and I think we're very quickly coming upon a time where Trinity Anglican in Tampa has to do multiple services on a Sunday. You know, it, it's coming. People desire a church. People desire to worship. They were created to worship. And when you have a wonderful place to worship Sunday and throughout the week, uh, they're drawn to that, even in Hooterville, even in Tampa, uh, even uh, if the, the, the leadership at the, the, uh, the head at 815 is leading the church in the wrong way, they still want to go and worship. And, you know, that, and, that, that, that's, the, that's the 39 articles right there. And I don't tell them <laughs> anything about New York. <laughs> yeah, geez. No mention whatsoever. You know, but we are here to, to raise up uh, a, a transformed generation. And, uh, um, and this is still our first story. Let's move on, George. What do I have for the second story? Uh, Not ooh, okay. uh, the, other yeah. rea- the, the, the overseas reactions. Yeah, well, well, okay, let's do the overseas reactions, and I want to move on to Hong Kong. Okay, no. Uh, the uh, Archbishop, the primate of all Nigeria, uh, Henry Ndekuba, put out a statement, which you can read on Anglican Inc., uh, condemning the uh, Church of England General Synod's vote, and it was using usual Nigerian intemperate language, making a point. Um, you know, the Nigerians have a tendency to be flamboyant and a little over the top at times, and it was, an unex- it was not unexpected. What I found more fascinating was Stephen Kazimba of the Church of Uganda's statement. They had a royal wedding in uh, Uganda week before last, I think it was. Uh, and uh, the first royal wedding of the king, of uh, the prince of Buganda, or the king of Buganda, which is where Uganda comes from, uh, since the 50s. Big show. That's a long time, yeah. And, you know, they didn't invite Michael Curry. I don't know why, but that's something. Love. Well, <laughs> after the service, uh, Henry Kazim, uh, Samuel Kazimba was uh, asked about the General Synod uh, vote. And his response was essentially, poof, you know, it's like these people. He could not work himself up to a froth over what the Church of England was doing because Welby and company were irrelevant. They, you know, it's like me reading about what the Seventh-day Adventists are doing in Chile. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Wow. Nothing to do with me. But well, this is he, the Church of Uganda and the yeah. Church of England. And Welby has so far taken the Church of England out of the epicenter of the Anglican world as to make it irrelevant to the Ugandan people. We posted a story on Anglican Inc. from journalistic hero Terry Mattingly, uh, who says, where's the press? They don't care anymore. It, seriously, 15 or 20 years ago, they would have sat, sent satellite trucks to cover what was happening in Synod in the Church of England. And the BBC has to be there because they record it. Nobody cares anymore, George. 20, gosh, oh, I feel old. 20 years ago, uh, after the Gene Robinson vote in the 2003. Gosh, that's been 20 years. I know. I had so much hair back then, George. <laughs> 20 years ago, the Living Church paid for me to go over to London for the emergency mm-hmm. primates meeting. Mm-hmm. And the press was outside of Lambeth Palace. And Lambeth Palace has a road, an embankment against, oh, against the Thames. It's on the south yeah. side of the Thames. And this big truck pulled up with a satellite on top. <laughs> and out popped Christiane Amanpour to do updates every, you know, 15 minutes from the scene of the Lambeth Palace emergency meeting. Uh, Kevin, I don't think that's ever going to happen again oh, in my life. No. Uh, I, I, the, the I next... share this story. I, I got it. Uh, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I get like my dad. I'm repeating <laughs> anecdotes. Some of you who've been watching for all the years we've been doing this will have heard this, but most people haven't. Uh, when reporters stand around waiting to waiting for something, they uh, talk to each other. And uh, 
Christian Amanpour had some producers who were coming out asking the regulars, reporters, you know, what's happening? What does this mean? What is that? And we all help each other, you know, for somebody who doesn't really cover, it's fun. Somebody who doesn't cover church affairs and reporters are now getting younger and dumber, uh, especially the TV ones each year. Uh, you, you don't have Walter Cronkite's and, uh, or, uh, Maury Safer in trench coats anymore in London. You have these dippy doo girls with spray, uh, with, with their hair as unmovable in the wind and whatnot. Well, I decided to have fun. And I was talking to Christiana Amanpour's producer, who was a young girl at the time. And I, I said, well, you know, there's a tunnel underneath Lambeth Palace, under the Thames, because right across from Lambeth Palace is the, uh, is Parliament. And, uh, and in back of that, of course, is Buckingham Palace. I said, there are these secret tunnels underneath. And in medieval, and in, uh, you know, that's where, like, the king would go. And during World War II, they would hunt. And so when the next thing came back, Christiane Amanpour comes out with her hair and her makeup and the Krieg lights and everything. And she gives this, nothing to report, but we're a place of mystery and this and that, where Lambeth Palace, ancient homes of the Archbishops of Canterbury, there's a tunnel under the River Thames and all this and that. Now... It's all untrue, of course. No, of course not. <laughs> but this is before Google. They couldn't just go back. This is before Google. <laughs> so, so this this is me being mean to uh, to the newbie uh, reporter. No, there but, you go. But you and I, we first met. Uh, well, we met at Hope in the Future. But we we uh, sat drinking Diet Coke in a tiki hut at uh, in Tanzania at the White Sands uh, Resort for a primates meeting, and that's where we we built up this great friendship. But we were there with reporters for that whole week. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like people just come and, hey, what's going on here? Uh, they were sent in to, to, to cover a church that was either going to uh, uh, adopt a new doctrine or fight uh, for its uh, current doctrine. And we watched slowly. It, most of it has eroded since then. What, what, do you remember in Tanzania? Uh, we really hung out with the, the big three, the Times, the Telegraph, and the yeah. Guardian oh, God, newspapers. Yes. And then there was a, a younger, this younger woman from uh, the Associated Press. And she, AP, brought, yeah. a, she brought a satellite uh, internet mm-hmm. connection. Yeah. The rest of us had to rely upon the terrible internet at the hotel. Uh, I don't know if it was dial-up, but it was just about that It was that close. Bad. It was DSL. It yes. was close. Yeah. And so she, the first day she got all these stories out when nobody else could because the internet would come down. And the second day she set up her little, looked like a sort of aluminum flower. Uh, uh, an early type Starlink, yes. Type, t- uh, yeah. Starlink, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, darned if it didn't keep getting unplugged. She couldn't and, get anything you know, else the whole week. She had this cable going <laughs> back to her room and somebody kept unplugging the cable. And somebody then stole the cable. And I, I don't know who it was, Kevin, but uh, I'm glad they don't have DNA technology in Tanzania I, no, or I'd and, still be in prison there. We'd still be in prison. Yeah. But fun stuff we do as reporters. Okay, let's move on to the next story. Uh, we have sources, um, one or two, I guess three, uh, out of Hong Kong. And they're telling us the news is not good. Um, it's getting worse. We, we knew this was going to happen. At some point... China wants to take over uh, completely Taiwan and Hong Kong, but they don't want the world to see them do it. What's the best way to do that? Attack the churches, attack the uh, uh, mayor's offices, attack uh, public buildings. But when I say attack, they do it virtually, George. The church is under extreme pressure in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And... This is really a time where the only thing that you and I can do, and our viewers, I hope they do, is pray for the clergy and the people of Hong Kong. What's happening? Well, the Chinese Communist Party is essentially put in a whole raft of laws that subordinate all civil institutions to the party. Islam, Buddhism, Christianity. um, There's nothing independent of the party. It's the way Nazi Germany worked. If there is something outside the party, then it, it could be then it's considered uh, anti-government, treasonous, anti-state. Recently, there was a Chinese seminarian 
Catholic who graduated who wanted to be faithful to Rome, wouldn't join the patriotic Catholic Church, and he was sentenced to prison for treason or something like that. He was sentenced Still to prison that, yeah. Yeah. for refusing to do that. Well, the Department of Religious Affairs out of Peking has uh, basically mandated that Christian churches must be sinicized, meaning they must conform to the party's Chinese ideology. Now, on a theological level, that means in some parts of China, the Ten Commandments are removed from the walls of churches and replaced it by sayings by Chairman Xi, the head of the Communist Party. Uh, photos or religious pictures are removed, crosses are taken down, and you're supposed to preach and teach a well-loved uh, version of communist ideology. Recently, the leaders of the Three Self Christian Movement, which is the official Chinese Protestant church, and it's also called the China Christian Council, came to Hong Kong to celebrate the 140th, 180th anniversary, some major anniversary. And they were basically, they basically told the people in Hong Kong, the Anglicans in Hong Kong, get on board, folks. You've got to conform. The Archbishop of Peking, who's Roman Catholic, but he's also a member of the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Church, came down and visited Peking, uh, Hong Kong, and told his Catholic uh, compatriots, sign up. And so what's happening is that the, the protections that the Vatican once <clears throat> afforded to Catholics in Hong Kong has disappeared because they've signed this agreement and basically abandoned faithful Catholics in Hong Kong. And Anglicans once had this with the pressure of the British government and the American government, well, of course, the Biden administration is hopeless, as is the Sunak administration. David Cameron's the new foreign secretary, and his first action uh, was to uh, uh, make a demand of African states that if you want aid money, you must sign up to the lesbian and gay agenda. So is he really going to step in and protect Christians in Hong Kong? So the Archbishop of Hong Kong is under tremendous pressure to moderate church doctrine, um, and when I'm talking about moderating church doctrine, meaning getting rid of justification by faith mm. and works, works that are conformed with the party's idea of social harmony. So we're talking about central Christian doctrines here that, you know, justification by faith versus works. Um, well, you can't serve two masters. I mean, there's lots of great doctrines, you know, that, uh, so that, and, the problem, and the problem both the Catholic and the Anglican churches have, is that they have some clergy in their ranks who are stooges of Peking. So the archbishops there, the cardinal archbishop and the Anglican archbishop, don't have united clergy in back of them. And they're also being faced with the exodus of the best and the brightest, those who can get a passport and those who have some money to leave. Mm -hmm. And those people, many of them are Catholics, they're Anglicans, they're Methodists, they're, they're westernized, acculturated, sophisticated Chinese who see the writing on the wall and want to get out. And they're leaving. And so the church is losing its more dynamic, I don't want to say all of it, but, you know, the church is being left with older people, with, uh, with poor people who can't leave, with people who like what's happening in Peking. And, and but so also they, people who just don't have the ability to fight. Yeah. You know, I, my you know my mom who's eighty five would not be one in the church who's going to 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 fight for the doctrine of the church. But looking at this from a bigger picture, the Chinese government, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, beyond their control, created the greatest underground church in the history of mankind mm -hmm. uh, by by their persecution of Christians in China. Will that also happen in Hong Kong? Will we find a, a, a beginning of an underground church there? Kevin, I'm going to be negative and say I doubt it. And that's because of the surveillance state that we now have. Uh, China, mostly rural, mostly poor. Um, not every city is Shanghai or this and that. Hong Kong is a, an urban city where you can monitor people um, with biometric devices, with cameras, 
And if a group of people are meeting in an apartment, the police will know about it and somebody will inform on them. It's closer. The situation is more East akin Germany. to East Germany yeah. in the 70s <clears throat> and 80s, where there will be informers and you can't escape the eye of the uh, secret police. Yeah. So I think that the elements that allowed people to meet in the countryside under a tree to worship Jesus Christ, and nobody knew about it, they're not there when you live in a tenement or you live in an apartment block or you whatnot in Hong Kong. So to the viewers of Anglican Unscripted and all your friends and everybody you know, let's keep Hong Kong, Hong Kong in our prayers. Uh, the news is not bad. It's all bad. And we need to be on our knees uh, for our friends, our sources, our clergy and laity there. Let's move on and talk about Ireland. <sighs> okay. Two Irish stories. Oh, yeah, it's my biggest record. Irish story. Yeah, my biggest Irish story is what they want to do to their free speech. But let's start with the church. Three yeah. Irish stories. Three Irish yeah. church. <laughs> so uh, the, there's a new diocese that has decided that they are going to endorse same-sex blessings. George, Cashel, Ferns, and Ossery which is one diocese yes, and it's Small United diocese. diocese. It was amalgamated about a hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, basically now the South and West of Ireland, three dioceses, all except for uh, Limerick or is it Cork? Cork. No, I'm sorry. All except for Cork have voted for gay blessings where in October, the Synod of uh, Cashel, Ferns and Ossery voted 101 to eight to ask the General Synod of the Church of Ireland next summer to, next year, excuse me, to uh, permit local option on same-sex blessings. They joined Dublin and Glenda Loch. I'm told that's how you say Glenda Loch. I've never been there. Hmm. As well as uh, <coughs> Tuam, Killaloo, and uh, Limerick. Um, and that's basically the West all around, except for the extreme southwest bit of, of Ireland. It's basically all the Republic of Ireland with two dioceses not in there. Now, will the Church of Ireland adopt gay blessings? No, no chance whatsoever. Why is that? Well, because 80% of the Church of Ireland is in Northern Ireland or in the areas adjacent to Northern Ireland and is conservative evangelical, not liberal Anglo-Catholic. What happened at, you know, after the Irish War of Independence or Civil War, whatever you want to call it, many parts of Southern Ireland witnessed the flight of the Church of Ireland Protestant middle classes. And so that the diocese of uh, Cashel, Ossery, Cashel, Ferns, and Ossery is roughly the size of my deanery and the next deanery put together within the Episcopal diocese. And Episcopal yeah. dioceses are tiny compared to Nigerian dioceses and whatnot. So, but up in Belfast and in the north, the, the overwhelming majority of people are traditional evangelical Anglicans. So, they're just not the votes and synod for this to happen. But here's the little kicker. The, with the exception of, the, of Meath and Kildare, almost all the dioceses in the south of Ireland are pro-gay. And you may see a push to divide the Church of Ireland into a two new churches, the Church of the Republic of Ireland and the Church of Northern Ireland. Um, and here's the funny thing, the Church of Ireland survived civil war and, you know, mass migrations and independence, but it may not survive the gay movement. Um, We'll see what happens. We'll see. Yeah, we'll have to see. Um, you and I have talked many times about border issues, immigration, legal and illegal immigration in our stories over the last uh, uh, 15 years, 10 years. I, we've done this forever, 12 years. And so in that, we have taken up the difficult discussion. And that is, what is the Christian response to immigration? And what is the uh, a national response and Ireland is a mess right now because they have uh, a conflict of their social ideals and what they're allowing in immigra illegal immigration. Um, and it's hard to watch because they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot, George. 
Ireland had a stabbing in Parnell Square, Dublin. Mm -hmm. And an Algerian immigrant who's been living in Ireland for a while stabbed five people, including three children. And uh, one or two of the children are still in intensive care. This prompted an, a riot in response by um, native Irish who basically protested enough is enough because the Irish government is even more liberal than the, the English, uh, the UK government on immigration. So they're welcoming all these people in, they're giving them places to live, they're giving them government allowances. And so if you're a working class Irishman in the north, northern slums of Dublin, who can't find a job, who can't find a place to live because he can't afford it and this and that, and you're whose seeing pen, immigrants- Whose pension keeps reducing because it's going to the immigration, yeah. You're seeing all the money that his parents or he pays all in taxes are going to pay for these foreigners who then um, have a higher standard of living than the locals caused an explosion. Uh, and the government's response was to denounce it as far right extremists. Well, no, it wasn't. It was just regular Irish working men and women. And a lot of the looting was from the immigrants who, hey, this isn't this fun uh, because, you know, we're boarded up in this uh, hotel and let's have some fun. Now, the, why the why this is an Anglican Inc. story is the Archbishop, Anglican Archbishop of Dublin, Michael Jackson, put out a statement. And Michael Jackson's statement it, it was in line with the cluelessness of the Irish government. Um, where he basically, you know, did it. Why can't we all get along? You know, we shouldn't hate the immigrants, all this and that. Where the Church of Ireland is totally out of touch with the working man. In England, we'd say the man in the white van, uh, the, you know, the tradesman. And uh, in America, the guy in the Chevy S10 pickup truck, totally out of touch, has no sense of the the fears, the hopes, the worries, and the aspiration, and throws all of its energy into the latest politically correct thing. And the Church of Ireland seems to hate the Irish people, is the sense of a lot of, uh, not a lot, I, I, I can't quantify it, but <clears throat> the person I talk to, the Church of Ireland seems to hate the Irish people and sure. prefers to replace the Irish people with Muslims from Algeria. Uh, you say the Church of England or, or the Church of Ireland. I say it's all of the leadership in Ireland. The leadership in Ireland is now proposing a law that would make it illegal to post memes or images that offend somebody. And uh, here's a quote from the Prime Minister who says, because it is not just the platform's who have a responsibility here, and they do, there are also individuals who post messages and images online that stir up hatred and violence. And we need to be able to use laws to go after them as well. And here in America for a short time, maybe not a long time, we've had freedom of speech. And that freedom is kind of limited to you can't say fire in a theater if there's no fire. Uh, over in Europe, Free speech is tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. And this new law in Ireland would make, would eliminate free speech. And I, I think of some of the great Irish freedom fighters of old. And uh, it, it's just a mess in my head. My, my head that needs antibiotics, George. <laughs> just like, oh, yeah. Well, we shouldn't just <clears throat> beat up on the Irish as much fun as it is to do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The... The Church of England has been noticeably absent from the events in the streets of the recent weeks. The pro-Palestinian marches, the anti-Semitism march in London had over 100,000 people, I understand, in its mm -hmm. march. And the now that many Church of England members, some from General Synod, I know one fellow, Martin Sewell, posted, who's a member of General Synod, who's a frequent commentator, posted his pictures from his march and the anti-Semitism march. But this is where the Archbishop, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, instead of going to the anti-Semitism march or getting involved in any of this stuff, had his picture taken planting a cherry tree in the backyard of Lambeth Palace Gardens. Now, on one level, Kevin, perhaps it's best that the Archbishop be kept 
doing the harmless things like planting cherry tree with the National do, Garden Society. Do no harm. Do no harm. Okay, do no harm. <laughs> but if the Church of England hates the English people, and that's the, uh, it, it, you know, you can be a Muslim immigrant and you can shout death to the Jews in those language. You can display Nazi swastikas and you are not bothered by the police. You can stand on top of the cenotaph, which is their memorial to the war dead of World War I. It's like going to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and vandalizing it, protesting it in America. And that's not a problem. But if you're a bunch of white guys, age Kevin's age, and you get mad at having Pakistani flags flying from the lampposts outside your building, the police will come with truncheons and tear gas and have no problem beating the crap out of you and getting you off the street. So we talk about the two-tier justice system where Black Lives Matter uh, uh, activists, Antifa activists can burn down federal buildings in Portland, can invade, uh, you know, Congress, the halls of Congress, uh, take over the, uh, the Senate chambers, and nobody gets arrested. Whereas little old ladies from Dubuque who go and stand outside the White House on January 6th or outside of Congress are arrested and, you know, uh, there's a two-tier justice system in the United States against what the state thinks is good. And there's also one in England and Ireland. Yeah. So the, the, the British police uh, will harass. Uh, there was a story a few months ago that Gavin Ashenden was really exercised about where a, a girl with Down syndrome called a police officer a lesbian. Uh, she said she reminded her of her grand who was a lesbian. And this was a police officer who, well, in the United States, we shave she was a golf pro or a field hockey coach. She had certain mannerisms and attributes that uh, were not feminine. And this girl was arrested for hate speech, a girl with Down syndrome. Um, whereas you can, you know, she, we haven't had these sorts of things since Oswald Mosley marched through the East End in the 1930s um, mm -hmm. with the British Union of Fascists yeah. or the uh, German-American Bund, their rally in 1938 or 39 in Madison Square Garden denouncing the Jews. Now, our police uh, are corrupted. Well, I, I I have available to me right here, but I want you to be able to listen to it. Is a interaction uh, last week uh, between a citizen of uh, uh, Britain and a police officer. This citizen was there protesting the uh, anti-Semitism that was uh, happening by the Palestinians marching in England, and uh, he, some cop saw him protest, you know, saying something. And here's the interaction. I want to be able to make you hear it too. So I'm going to do, uh, you need to hear this through here. Let's see if that will help. You'll probably hear a little echo if I talk, but. So by shouting at them, you may be committing a public order offense for which you can be arrested. I'm trying to reasonably discuss that with you. I just said I'm sure, know what you want to discuss Make sure me. that nothing further happens. Nothing further is going to happen. I'm on my way. I'm voicing my opinion. I'm on my way. We're going to a gig. That's it. End of story. No need for you to grab me and manhandle me right. and tell me you're going to arrest me. From, from what I... they're telling me, you may have committed an offence. That oh, gives me the right to keep hold of you until I can discuss this and find out if you have committed any offences. I've committed no offence, mate. Right? In your opinion? Yeah, my opinion. A Hamas not a terrorist organisation? Hamas are a prescribed organisation, yeah. So terrorist sympathisers in. When you see things right. get... Free Palestine means free Palestine right. of the Jews. Well, right. I haven't, I've literally just got here, so I haven't read any of their signs, okay? If any of their signs say say anything that I think is a public order offence, I'll be dealing with them as well. What I'm trying to do is facilitate their legitimate right to a peaceful protest without being abused by people who it's may not disagree abuse. with Why is that abuse? That's free speech, mate. It may be free speech to you. That's why, that that's why I was trying to speak to you to ascertain what you said to them and why you said it. 
terrorism. Do you, do you, do you understand I, where I understand I'm coming fully. from? I've had enough of it. Like, everywhere you go in the UK at the moment, this shit's going on. Well, do you not think we've had enough of it? You've probably had enough of it dealing right, with it. They've got a legitimate right to peaceful protest, and my job is to allow And that. I've got a right to say terrorist organisation, Hamas. I've got a right to that. Okay, Hamas might be a terrorist organisation, but why are you shouting at them? Because I don't, I've had enough of it. Oh, Everywhere do you, you go. Do you know them personally? No, that's not free speech. That's not what free speech looks like. Let's see here. Boom, connect. All right, good. So there, I got the audio working. And we want to offer more of that in the, in the future without me getting copyright dings from YouTube. But, you know, it, they have taught their police to go after the good guys. Mm -hmm. that, that's and crazy. We're, well, we're going to see more of that uh, Christian climate action, <laughs> which is a, uh, with these are the people that uh, glue themselves to highways and block traffic and, yeah. you know, try to dump paint on works of art and whatnot. Well, there was a recent court case where their activists were uh, found not guilty, even though they were guilty, of uh, disrupting the peace and blocking trains and this and that. And the basically Christian climate action is taken away from the, the fact that they, there was jury nullification where the jury didn't want to convict these people, that they cannot do anything. And they've announced that they're going to start a campaign against the cathedrals of the Church of England. Every one of these cathedrals that has a Barclays account, Barclays Bank, they're going to stage protests outside the cathedrals and inside the cathedrals during worship services. Recently, there was uh, uh, two people from Christian Climate Action, one of whom was an 82-year-old woman vicar of the Church of England, interrupted the service at St. Paul's Cathedral to say how evil St. Paul's was because they had a Barclays account. Well, Barclays uh, has uh, investments in the petrochemical industry, which, according to Christian Climate Action, is evil. <clears throat> and now that uh, the courts have basically said that uh, they get a get-out-of-jail-free card to disrupt public life, Christian Climate Action is going to take it to the next level. Uh, I, I, so I, 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 once on, it's a little bit warmer and not raining, you're going to see these guys outside your cathedrals and interrupting everything. What industry? Petrochemical, oil, oil gas. Oil? Where did uh, Archbishop Justin Lobby work before he was Archbishop? Shell, I believe. I oh, well, whatever. Yeah, what comes around goes around. A little karma, but you know, yeah. I mean, we have protected. We are legally protecting through our laws victims and victimhood, mm -hmm. where victims will have more rights than a person who pays their taxes, goes to church on Sunday. Uh, raises a family, your rights are being uh, delegated uh, to the lowest common denominator. I'm sorry to say, let's move on. You talked about Christian climate. Oh, well, okay, we got good news this week. Uh, the ACN, ACNA Hymnal Commission uh, looks very good from the news we're hearing. This is a very important story that will never get the press that it deserves. Yeah. The hymnals in churches for most people, are deeper sources of doctrine than the prayer book. Um, because when you sing a hymn, you're basically singing the theology of the church. Now, when the Episcopal Church does hymnal revision, it does petty hymnal revision. Instead, we drop onward Christian soldiers because we're pacifists this year, or we no longer sing God rest ye merry gentlemen, it's God rest ye merry gentlefolk, or some horrible like you know, gender identity <clears throat> nonsense like that. <clears throat> The ACNA is putting together a new hymnal that teaches the doctrine of the church, the Reformed Catholic faith. And the members of this commission are musicians, which is a good thing, because it needs to absolutely have a nice tune and be yeah. singable. Yeah. There's nothing worse than uh, these dreary hymns that uh, seem to get pulled out in Advent, especially. And also people with a theological bent, so that what you're singing reflects the teachings of the church. So they've not produced anything yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing what this hymnal has. Sure. And now I'm not worried that this will come with directions like turn the smoke machine on now or the or the uh, worship leader now repeats the refrain for the 15th time. Well, I, 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 we, we've been told that, you know, this is going to be hymns and not uh, renewal music. And I appreciate that. When I was a young Christian in the 80s, I tended to like more renewal music, more of the, the was the, uh, not vintage, uh, 
starts with V out there in California. Uh, and I like that more renewal type music that uh, Vineyard. And uh, it was it was soothing to me. It was easy to sing, and it it sounded nice. I have matured in my faith, uh, and for the last fifteen or twenty years, I I'm a hymn guy. I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> it just if, like, if that's a standard, if you know, then we should just have elevator music and just I have know. the girl from Ipanema playing yeah, every Sunday yeah. because that's yeah. easy to listen to. It's singable. It's mm -hmm. sweet words and. Uh, and, and oh, here's look. here's sinful Kevin at the back of the church. If there's not enough hymns during the service, there wasn't enough hymns during the service. You know, I, and uh, <laughs> it's like, but I appreciate them because they do teach theology and doctrine. And it's the would you have a service of liturgy, uh, uh, liturgy where you wouldn't have a reading from the Old Testament? No, absolutely not. We we incorporate the, the wholeness of the church, and that's the hymns. I just now I know I know this won't happen, but my secret fear is that this hymnal is a worship leader's book, and I think one of the major mistakes of the Christian churches in the West of the last generation has been the creation of worship leaders, separating music singing from the congregation, to put it in the hands of professionals. Um, you know, at Gafcon, I like the choirs. I can't stand these, you know, guys with skinny jeans and plaid shirts and a little beard right here who sing these songs with a refrain that repeats itself 25 times. Oh, I worship you. And it's like, oh, come on, fella, get a life. Uh, this is this is your trying to entertain me to create a mood. And I I believe that congregational singing and sharing in uh, these st shared statements of doctrine is very important for teaching people. I, you know, well, let's take something, I'll give you an example. I sing a song of the saints of God, faithful and brave and true, uh, you know, teaches the Anglican understanding of who the saints of God are. One was a soldier, one was a priest, one was slain by a fierce wild beast. And there's not any reason, no, not the least, why I shouldn't be one too meaning we all have the potential to be saints of God within us, that they're not people separate from us. That's the work of a hymn. So I learned that when I was five or six, and it helped form my understanding of who saints are. And I think the ACNA and looking at their people and knowing some of them on that commission, like Bob Duncan, I think, I think he's on there. That's how they see music. Sure, I think so too. As a teaching tool, as a yeah. faith tool. Well, I mean... Favorite song, These Are the Days of Elijah. Well, it's not true. That's bad doctrine. These are not the days of Elijah. You know, and so, he, yeah, it, I, I'm glad we have a commission looking into this, and I look so forward. Maybe uh, down the road we'll get an interview with the, the head of the commission uh, as they, they get ready to publish. I don't want, I don't want to bother them. or uh, Like, we talked about this a year ago, and some mean people who watch the show tried to contact them and say, we don't want any renewal music. No, don't do that. Let the process work it out. Let, and please. if Michael Row the Boat Ashore comes on, <laughs> yes. don't worry. I mean, don't we've got to leave something for, for, for the uh, aging hipster. <sighs> All right. So um, we've reported extensively over the last uh, couple episodes about what's been happening in Israel uh, and uh, the Middle East between Gaza and Hamas, West Bank, uh, it's, it's a mess. However, I want to offer a little hope, and it's Anglican hope, George, from a, a country that persecutes uh, Christians and Jews. Malaysia. Yeah, the Gaza, were, as we're filming this, they're on a, on a ceasefire to exchange hostages. Uh, hostages for convicted uh, criminals uh, who are Palestinians. And Malaysia, the state of Malaysia, does not have relations with Israel, and it discourages its people from going to Israel. You can't, you know, you can't use your passport there, whatnot. And the Malaysian government told the schools that uh, to take this week off, we're going to have mass rallies and protests against Israel. And the Anglican schools of uh, Borneo, in the North Borneo, Sabah, Sarawak, uh, the, the, 
the head of the schools there, the Bishop of Kuching, Daniel Jute, said, no, we are not going to get involved in this. We are not going to protest for one side or the other. We wish peace on both. And we're going to keep our kids in schools. Thank you very much. This is a remarkable statement because by saying we are we want the war to end and we're not going to parade in favor of one or the other, in a, where the state is saying you must parade in favor of one side, that's a courageous statement by the Anglican Church in Borneo because they are going against the government's firm conviction that Israel is the monster here. And that's a degree of heroism that we don't see in the West very often. Um, we certainly don't see it in my church or the Church of England, um, standing against uh, injustices like that when the government's really pushing it. So kudos to uh, Bishop Jute and the, uh, the uh, bishops of uh, North Borneo. Uh, God is, you know, he's... You know, from, from, as growing up, Borneo was always like the end of the world. The you know, it's close. <laughs> darkest, <laughs> deepest civilization. Yeah. yeah, there are now more Anglicans in the diocese of uh, Sarawak mm -hmm. than there are in Central Florida by a factor of three. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's no longer the end of the world, but it's still really humid over there. Yeah. Really humid. Well, it's humid here eight months a year. <laughs> But the interesting thing is, one of the things you'll be seeing, we're now in the uh, terrorist apology tour. We're getting uh, people, Palestinians, who have some links to the West, coming back to the West and telling these horrific stories about the uh, attacks by Israel and this and that in response. And the problem is, we have people in the West who are uncritical and they don't think. Some with a long memory may remember the name of an Anglican woman named Hana Ashrawi. She uh, is uh, one of the leaders of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and she's a uh, mouthpiece uh, for, for, had been a mouthpiece for Yasser Arafat in the PLO, and she's also an Anglican. She's a Christian. And whenever she would come to the West, she would get an uncritical reception from certain church groups because she's one of us. Well, her Palestinian nationalism trumps her Anglican identity in her case. And we're seeing uh, this disinformation campaign where people will, you know, President Biden, you know, just apologized for questioning the Hamas death toll. Um, he, he, he apologized to a Muslim America, the Council on American Islamic Relations, which yeah. is an unindicted co conspirator in a number of terror cases. Okay. I, uh, George, mm -hmm. I indict them. Now they're indicted. And be very careful of what you read and what you hear about these things, um, especially when they cannot be documented or corroborated. Now, people will say, well, I heard it on the BBC. Well, I heard it on NBC. Well, BBC and NBC use Palestinian stringers, and they have just done a dreadful job in reporting on this war. Sure. Um, MSNBC is even worse. Yeah, and so just hold, uh, hold your judgment in suspension on things like the numbers of people killed, about <clears throat> deliberate murders and massacres and this and that. Um, until you can see the evidence with your own eyes. Yeah. Now, now that's the, what the Israelis have done with the initial stuff. They put out public films mm -hmm. to show the evidence with our own eyes. Yeah. It's we've we've hit the one hour mark, so we're gonna we're gonna close down the show. But over the next couple of weeks, I wanted you to watch for a couple of things. One is China is beginning to show the West a little bit more peace. Okay. Uh, the economic turmoil that's going to hit China over the next year will be unfathomable. Okay, they, they're they going to have a, a little, uh, little. they're going to have a big economic collapse. I don't know how big, but they're, they're overbuilt, over real estate, uh, overburdened, and they have no women. It, it's not going to be pretty over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that last one, Kevin, shocked me. And they've got no girls. No girls. Oh, my. Okay. So the party's well, going to be really dull. <laughs> dull. Uh Russia is starting to to talk a little bit more peaceful about Ukraine uh, and, and 
uh, Putin in a speech says he's all but given up on a, a war with Ukraine, but he's not willing to stop it. It's, it's different talk from Putin. That's something we'll, we'll watch out for the next couple of weeks to see what happens if these reports and these stories are actually true. But I, I want you to watch out for what a country does when it hits this type of economic collapse when they're communist. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know what happens here. We have recessions and depressions and stuff like that. A communist country does handles it much differently and much more violently than we do. So just keep your eyes out for that. We'll certainly be reporting it here on Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 832 of Anglican Unscripted. Thank you.